pays for all this research? Public money. This is basic research, and basic research is paid, is funded by public money. If you live on Earth, I guarantee there is a particle accelerator lab working to find dark matter near you. Oh yes, they're everywhere, they're on every continent, almost every country, and they're growing. Now, our governments are spending hundreds of billions of dollars. I'm sure if you added it all up, it's in well into the hundred million billions. Like, it's ridiculous, which I've actually heard them say that, hundred million billions. And is that even a thing? Anyway, they're looking for dark matter, and they think neutrinos, the VVV, triple VOV, like we were talking about before in a previous video, they think that the sterile neutrino, which has no charge, is dark matter. And in every single one of their videos, they promote the globe Earth, which I think is up for debate and should be on the table for discussion. Flat Earth could be the biggest of all the Mandela effects. I actually think that, there, that there's a dome, a firmament that's been created and that we have right now the unique experience of having both. We have the globe Earth and the flat Earth. I'll do another video about that. The point is, I'd like to go over a few things that I have discovered about these particle physics labs, which I like to call messing with matter places. Um, they're on a mission to find dark matter, and they are convinced that dark matter and dark energy not only exist, which we don't know if they exist, but are 95% of the universe. I don't think that's right. I'm just going to fight against that. There's no proof dark matter exists, and we started out chasing what our creation story was. Where did we come from? What are, what's the history of the matter of <laughs> what we are? But no, now we're chasing dark matter. So let's talk about what are particle accelerators even used for? Why are there 30,000 of them? Really fast. Scientists use this high energy tool to better understand the laws of physics and find explanations for theories to explain matter, space, and time. And we need 30,000 of them to do that. You probably live not too far from one. There are over 30,000 particle accelerators all over the world. Oh, my bad. We need over 30,000 of them. You're right. Doing a variety of jobs that sometimes have nothing to do with particle physics. If you're in Paris, France, admiring the towering glass pyramid at the Louvre Museum, there is a particle accelerator 15 meters below you. Yeah. In the basement, physicists use their particle accelerator called AGLAE for cultural preservation. And in layman's terms, that means they appraise the value and check for authenticity, I'm sure. Wouldn't want to lose any money, for heaven's sake. Do you want more specifics? Of course you do. These scientists use Aglae to identify the minerals in the eyes of the famous 4,500-year-old Egyptian sculpture called the Seated Scribe. Why are they mentioning this creepy statue? And I've never heard of it, but it's famous. I mean, I guess amongst art students. Well, whatever. How about another? Yes, please. No one likes contaminated food, right? Well, you can thank your friendly neighborhood particle accelerator for zapping any traces of E. coli or salmonella from your groceries. You've likely heard of foods being irradiated. No, don't irradiate the food. Oh man, no wonder there's no nutrients in veggies. Grocery irradiation works by shooting a stream of high energy particles into the food, thus killing all the bacteria while maintaining the quality of the produce. It's easy. It's sort of like pasteurizing milk or canning food, except scientists are using laser beams plus amazingness. So if you see this symbol next to a bag of spinach, it means it's been treated with a particle accelerator and that you should probably get excited and tell everyone at the store around you. Some of the most ubiquitous accelerators aren't cyclical ones like the Large Hadron Collider, but instead they're linear, a straight line like a launch device for an aircraft carrier, but instead they're launching particles. These are called LINACs, or linear accelerators. The longest LINAC in the world is at the Slack. It's buried underground. If you've ever driven on a section of Highway 280 in California, you've driven right over it. What? I know. LINACs, like the one at the Slack, are used by hospitals to kill cancer. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. No matter what they say particle accelerators are good for, don't get sucked into the trap. These things are not what they appear to be or not what they're saying they are. So I know a little bit about this because I had three people very close to me right around the time that the Mandela effect was just taking effect. 
all got sick with cancer at the same time, same exact time. And I studied a lot about it. There are a lot of cures for cancer, and I'm gonna do a video about this too, but they are lying when they say that it's for free energy or it's for cancer research. There are so many free energy options that have been discovered over the years, and anyone who has realized that or taken any initiative to create one has been ridiculed and their labs burned and stopped. It's about the money. That's what it's about. And they need billions and billions of dollars to get these things built and to staff them and maintain them and to fix them because they're always needing maintenance. And let me, let me go into a little bit about what I've come to realize in this research. And please leave your comments below about where you would specifically like me to research next because I'm going to be doing videos every week about all of these facilities and I'm gonna get the word out. Because straight up, these things are changing our history. They're manipulating matter on the quantum level, which quantum just means really small, microscopic level. And I am tired of this. So I want everybody to know about the particle accelerator labs in their areas. And I guarantee you live so close to one, you could drive there today and do a tour. If you've seen my other videos, you know why I feel that this is the cause of the Mandela effect and other such horrifying phenomena because of the quantum entanglement created by particle collisions. Now, here we go. So I've discovered some interesting things about particle physics labs in general. Um, a lot of them began in the late 60s or seven, early 70s and they began as particle science places. Um, this seems very out of place to me technologically from the time period. And that examples of that are SLAC in California, Fermilab in Illinois, and Triumph in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and I, I didn't think they would spend hundreds of millions of dollars at the time on particle research, particle collision research. Anyway, there's that. Also others like Oak Ridge and National Laboratories of Tennessee used to be nuclear weapons research and just nuclear facilities. Um, they turned multidisciplinary, quote unquote. <laughs> and so now they're huge research science labs, which have been awarded triple or so money from the funding um, they usually are all funded by the Department of Energy. Um, some now of those nuclear facilities are now Homeland Security funded, other military factions and initiatives. Almost all of them were started as one thing and then refurbished, redesigned for something else or obviously added on too. Um, and I think it's for the money. Uh, there's another thing they do for the money that <laughs> is they join with colleges. Um, as many as they can. And so then they get, you know, double the, double the funds, double the grants, double the everything from that. So that's how they fund these huge multi-billion dollar projects. And who pays for it? The people, the people pay for it. Yay. So, um, all right. Then there are some of the weird ones, like in South Dakota and Minnesota, there are underground mines that were turned into deep underground neutrino finding facilities. And then there's Antares, which is an underwater project that is in the Mediterranean Sea, but spans across both the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. Um, there's Ice Cube, which is a lab built smack dab in the middle of Antarctica. And they cut big, huge holes in the ground and then they send in these detector things. Um, the project names are peculiar. There's, I mean, you know, you all have heard of Atlas and Alice at CERN, but then there's, um, for some of these other ones, there's Zeus, Phoenix, Griffin, Hera, Heracles, Minos, Castle, Dune, Isaac, Isis, Diana, who was AKA Ishtar, AKA Semiramis. So yeah, they're using a lot of peculiar names. They're also, um, the the names of their quote unquote experiments and projects that they work on are called inconspicuous things that you wouldn't think are you know particle colliding or 
breaking apart matter to create other pieces of matter. Um, it, they call them microscopes, uh, lasers, um, telescopes, x-rays. They don't call them what they are, which is particle accelerators and straight up messing with matter. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty disenchanted with the way all this has gone down. It seems to me, looking at all this, like it's not a very, well, first of all, it's not our real history. It's not what has happened, but it is now. It's now what has happened in our history. And I found this, this is about x-rays. It's a deviation in our history, I believe. And it says the first accelerators, which were cyclotrons, were built by particle physicists in the 1930s. Um, the nucleus of the atom was split in these cyclotrons using the collision of high energy particles. And from the results of these collisions, physicists tried to deduce the laws of fundamental physics that govern our world and the whole universe, kind of like what they've been doing at the LHC. Uh, synchrotron radiation was seen for the first time at General Electric, huge company in the United States in 1947 in a different type of particle accelerator called the synchrotron, which those are still seen today. It was considered a nuisance first because it caused the particles to lose energy, but then it was recognized in the 1960s as light with exceptional properties that overcame the shortcomings of X-ray tubes. Aha, so just about that time they started popping up everywhere in the United States. And so in the mid to late 70s, scientists began to discuss ideas for using synchrotrons to produce extremely bright X-rays. These discussions led to the construction in the late 80s and the early 90s of the ESRF, which is a big one in Europe, and shortly thereafter, um, the other synchrotrons, which are, they call the light sources. These are pretty interesting things. And again, and actually I've found records of them being built as early as the 40s. So synchrotrons, cyclotrons, these things are particle accelerators and they're huge and they've been around a long time. Um, I think we've all heard those words too in our heads before. It's not like they're not concepts that we kind of have, I don't know, they're familiar, right? Very strange, very strange stuff, but these are huge particle accelerators and they're usually a big part of the labs that are these huge complexes of government slash, you know, state slash college slash federal funded organizations. So yeah, these are all particle collision that create entanglement that cause changes in our very time and space matter. They're messing with matter and they're looking for dark matter and I am tired of nobody knowing about it. So um, leave a comment if you'd like me to search any particular place of the world. Um, I'm just gonna start making videos that are about each one of these huge facilities. Um, by the way, I've seen a lot of anomalies with uh, animals being around these huge facilities. They have a bunch of white deer, like 40 white deer live next to Argonne in Illinois. So anyway, um, thanks for watching and please uh, give some feedback and much love to everybody. The more you know.